my, my father was a scientist and my mother was an artist and a musician, so I grew up working both sides of the street. And in fact, I could never see any real difference between the, the two so-called sides of the seat. Um, the science side is actually an art, as any scientist will, will tell you. And uh, it's the newest of the art, maybe the greatest of the art forms of the, of the 20th century. Um, now, I, my awesome task here, I was going to say I, I'm the only thing that stands between you and lunch, but it's actually more dire than that. I'm the only thing that stands between you and the bathroom. <laughs> so um, if you start fidgeting, I'll realize I should speed up and get to my final point. Now, in a half-hour talk, I think the best thing to do is to just bring up a few ideas to think about. As the introduction in indicated, I my sort of switched over from being a professional musician to being a full-time computerist when, through looking at the work of Seymour Papert in the early six in the 60s, 1968 or so. I realized that what we had here was not just a tool like a screwdriver, but we had a medium. We had something like what the printing press was, and it was going to have many degrees of freedom, and the tools were going to be made inside of it. Now, the tools on the printing press are things like comic books, biblical tracts, romance novels, political essays, scientific papers. In other words, all the different forms of rhetoric that have been formed to express things. And we realized back then that the destiny of the computer was going to be one of these things. It was going to be a 500-year invention. Only one, you only get one of these every 500 years. And that like the printing press, it was going to completely redefine childhood. And we were just starting to suffer back then through another technology that was starting to redefine childhood called television. And I don't think television has redefined childhood for the better. I think the printing press did, and so the 60s ethic that we had back then is let's make sure the computer doesn't turn out like television. Let's make sure it turns out with the content carrying, the argument carrying, the range and depth for artistic expression that the printing press gave us. Well, the jury is still out on that, and it'll be out for another 25 or 30 years. And this group is part of that jury because there are lots of different ways of interpreting what a computer is and can do. One of the ways that educational institutions sometimes look at it, and parents often do as well, is as something that is very important um, for their children's prospects of getting a job later on something every parent is very anxious about, both for uh, good reasons and also they may perhaps would like to be assured that the kids will move out of the house in a decent interval. And I call this the driver's ed theory of the computer. Uh, everybody needs to learn how to drive, uh, particularly down here in Southern California. We all know that, and we have driver's ed programs for it. It's about getting from A to B what I call A to B-ness. A to B-ness. There's a problem, so we work out some solution to it. We'll teach the kids how to drive. Now, nobody here, I think, would suggest that because the kids are going to learn how to drive when they're 16 or so, that we should strap them into motorized vehicles at age six. But think about it. Think of all of those extra years they would have learning how to steer. All of those things that we could do but we would say, no, that's ridiculous. We're going to completely um, stunt their muscular growth. That's a terrible technology for children. It's one that adults can use more reasonably because they can decide whether they're going to exercise or decide whether they're going to go in a car. But if we just strap the kids into that thing, we are actually setting up a process that will atrophy something that's very important about a child. So I think all of us would agree that if we were going to give a child a transportation technology, we'd want it to be more like a bicycle, because a bicycle allows the child to exercise flat out, and it amplifies that. Right? So I don't believe, for, especially for early childhood education, that there's any necessary connection 
between the vocational aims later on and what we want to do with uh, children in the early grades. What we really want to do with children in the early grades is get them, is help them build the intui intui intuitions, the intui intuitive foundation that they're going to need to learn in crisper form later on this complicated century that we're in and the even more complicated century to come. So this is a very complex issue because there's a lot of anxiety. And in fact, one of the one of the most horrifying sights to me, having been doing this now for 25 years, is happening today when you're taken to a school to observe and you go into it and this, the principal takes you into this classroom where there are lots of computers on the desk and the kids are happily working away and the teacher is happy and there's some parents observing. They're happy. The kids are happy. And you know what? Nothing is happening. Nothing important is happening. It's just like a bunch of illiterates sitting around being able to deal with a couple of words in a book. And it only seems like a good thing if you don't happen to know what the real thing is. This is true in mathematics, too. As my introducer said, I have a degree in mathematics, and uh, I can't think, I, I can maybe think of one classroom in 500 that I've been to in an elementary school in the last 25 years in which I've seen actual mathematics happen. What's really going on is a process called learning how to do the arithmetic of accounting, and it happens to be called math. Just like junk food has the label hamburgers. Now, if you think of there being a dictionary police around, they would get after people who use old labels for things on stuff that's just plain crap. But in fact, if you can get millions of people to accept that as the standard, and you do that by simply flooding the marketplace with both advertising and exemplars of this stuff, people adjust their norms accordingly. And so what is likely to happen with computers is that the easiest problem to solve is putting a computer or 50 of them in every classroom. It's just stuff. And there's nothing easier to make in the 20th century than stuff. And the easiest stuff to make in the 20th century happens to be made out of silicon. And it's going to be easier and easier as we go through years from now. The accurate prediction of what was going to happen to silicon was made in 1965 by Gordon Moore, who then went on to found Intel. And that he has been off by less than 5% in those 30 years since then. This is how you guys got to the moon, right? It was right where Newton said it was going to be. Um, so to, to me, and this is not to downgrade the space program, because I'm a, I'm a real, have been a real nut about that my whole life, but one of the, one of the slides I like to show is a, co a comparison of the Earth taken from space, maybe even on your voyage, with uh, a globe made in 1780 which is how people who couldn't get out into space thought the Earth might look, and it looks exactly the same. Now, which one is more impressive? Think about it. To know your universe without being able to take that Olympian view is an incredible feat. And the thing that would have been surprising if they'd gotten out there and they'd found a surprise. It would have been surprising if the moon weren't where it's supposed to be. It would have be surprising if the Earth didn't look the way we think it looked like. Now think of what that means. And it also would have been very surprising if silicon hadn't turned out the way Gordon Moore predicted it because he was a physicist and he was using really good science to make that prediction. Now in spite of that, the personal computer has taken everybody by surprise because nobody believed it. IBM didn't believe it. DEC didn't believe it. Right? But in spite of this, it was something that is going to continue again. So don't even worry about getting the stuff into the school. But consider the following dilemma. Suppose, and actually we could even imagine this somewhat seriously here in Los Angeles where we have a lot of showbiz. Suppose the actual issue weren't computers, but suppose it had to do with music. Suppose the parents were getting really anxious, maybe because of watching too much MTV, that children were not going to succeed in life as musicians. And they start beating on the state legislature and they start beating on the L.A. County School Board for years and years and years about our children are not getting any training as musicians. And finally, the politicians say, all right, 
we've got a solution. We will put a piano in every classroom. And unfortunately, we don't have enough money to get any musicians to deal with this, but what we'll do is we'll take the existing teachers and give them two weeks of training in the summer. <laughs> Think about it. Every musician knows that the music is not in the piano. If we were, we'd have to let it vote. <laughs> if there's music, and this is where the quote from Plato is the right one, the music is a soft fire in every child, and it's a fire that has to be fanned. And it's fanned by doing music. You don't need a piano or anything else. You just need some people around to have music happen. We already have all the musical instruments we need, and we also have all the instruments we need for thinking. And so a piano at its best is a kind of an amplifier. It's not the thing. A computer at its best is a kind of an amplifier. And amplifiers don't care much what they amplify. Right? You put bad signals into them, and you're going to get those bad signals back out in a huge, huge profusion. And that is precisely what you're going to get you put the amplifier like the computer in without having some sense of what it is inside the children that you're going to try and light, not to light it up because it's already lit. That's one of the most marvelous things about six-year-olds is that they already are terrific scientists, they already are terrific mathematicians, they already are terrific computerists, they're already terrific artists. They've got the whole nine yards. I'd rather work with first graders than any other age, including adults. They are just the greatest. But they can't tell you what you do to do with a computer. This is a fond myth that the children will show us. No way. The children are great mathematicians at age six, but they can't tell you what you should be teaching them so that they'll be great mathematicians at age 15, or great, ma or great computerists or great writers or any of those things. What they've got is the start of the whole thing, and it's our job to try and figure out what this thing is. We have to figure out what it is. We have to figure out what the, uh, what the ethics are that are connected with it, what, it's, what the appropriateness is of connected with it. So now here's, here's an interesting paradox, and this has happened to me many times over the past years, is I've been invited to give a talk about the, about the future of technology, and when I asked for AV equipment, I was told, sorry, we can't do that. <laughs> Now, I always, I always give demonstrations. I always have supporting media, just as we would like to have in our schools. Um, I can say that if I had to uh, think of a percentage, I would say that um, college schools of education probably are the least equipped to deal with a talk on the technology of the future. Right? Because and one of the ways of thinking about it, because it was perceived as a difficulty, partly because of the light here, uh, you should think that and realize that this technology is not here yet. Most of this stuff is not really here yet. There is still time to try and understand it and to think about it appropriately. In fact, if you think about it for, for a couple of seconds, about 95% of the deep content that humans have come up with can be printed in the Los Angeles Times. It can be printed on newsprint in cruddy old black and white and not terribly good contrast ratio. And the reason is, is because most of the human content has been encoded into symbolic forms that don't require a super high resolution in order to get that rendering perfect. All right? it's, now, great art, you can say, well, you can't put that in the Los Angeles Times. But the truth is, you can't put great art in a wonderful coffee table book with high resolution color photographs. And anybody who thinks you can has never seen the real thing. So you have to realize for stuff like that, the best you can do and the worst you can do are both ads. They're advertisements for the real thing. Right? But the nice thing about all of the literature in the world and all of the science in the world and all of the math in the world and all of the music in the world is that you can put it onto something that is actually quite low tech. And in fact, the three most important things you can ever learn through a computer can be done on an Apple II. It can be done on a little Casio or a sharp wizard that you can put in your pocket, buy it for 200 bucks. The most important things you can ever do. Now, you can't imitate all the things that paper can do on a sharp wizard. And some of those things we do want to do. 
but we have to separate out the distinction, just as we should separate out the distinction in learning to read between um, actually reading and understanding complex ideas. Now, the state framework for English in the language arts is my favorite framework. Uh, a framework, by the way, that is not, is a perfect example of, I think, what happens when you have very talented people who did an outstanding job formulating the ideas in that framework. It is a model. You could use it for science. You could use it for math. It is fabulous. It has almost completely failed in the state of California over the last 10 or 12 years. I've been following it very closely. Now, they had a wonderful idea based on some of the ideas of Frank Smith, who is a marvelous uh, educator uh, in Canada, that the core of any literature program is ideas, powerful ideas, the kinds of ideas and issues that human beings need to think about and talk about. And that is what you have to get into the classroom before literature makes any sense. Why go to all that trouble reading those long sentences if the, they aren't about something? And so Frank Smith's idea is you should start off with the ideas. And the teachers have to be um, comfortable at dealing with ideas that many of them which have no good answers and have to deal with the notion that they're going to be arguing about these ideas with the kids and that's what they want and that there's a supporting literature and there's a reading and writing process that supports that and I think that's a wonderful model it should be adopted for the computer and the number one thing about it is that because we've had this stuff around for hundreds of years, it was easy for Frank Smith to say that the issue has to do with ideas. Now, we don't know what to say about computers. What is the issue with computers? Are they adding machines? Are they things who are designed to imitate other, like being more erasable paper, slightly better calculators? You know, are they a philosophical um, form? Is there something like the essay yet to come that's going to allow us to change our conceptions of the way humans live together? Is there going to be a new kind of science? In fact, we know there is going to be a new kind of science based entirely on the existence of the computer because it allows us to deal with models that, don't, uh, that can't be handled with ordinary mathematics. There's a whole bunch of stuff coming. But to me, the most important thing before we worry about teaching the computer so much is that we'd make our first research project to ask, what is it? And actually, the, the is, you know, English is a tough language because it has hard nouns. You, whenever somebody says a noun, you start looking around for the thing. Um, so a better word is to say, what ising? What is the computer ising? What science ising? So civilization, for instance, is not a thing. It's a process. It's the process of trying to be more civilized. Science is not a thing. It's the process of trying to be more scientific. And thinking is the process of trying to think better. There isn't a place on it, but there are thresholds that are, that are very important. So a, a cautionary tale, just to throw in here, is a, an educational technology that I'm very fond of, um, which is called the basic organization of knowledge. Now, you may not have heard about this educational technology, but it was invented a while ago. And it had some wonderful characteristics. It was solid state, self-powered, super high resolution, capacity one to 100 megabytes. The cost is only about five to $10 per megabyte. Um, many millions of different titles available. And it can hold the highest thoughts that human beings have ever formulated. Does anybody guess what that basic organization? Yeah, the book, the B-O-O-K. In case you've forgotten, since I can't show slides, I've actually brought some concrete. OK, here's a B-O-O-K. And here's one of my favorite ones, Tom Paine's Common Sense. This is a short one. It's only 50 pages long. But consider the following. This thing was written in about seven weeks, late, later months of 1775, published in January 1776. We were already fighting the British, and we weren't sure quite why, 
except there are some things about taxation without representation and so forth. And this book is an argument. It's a 50-page argument about why monarchies might not be the best way of organizing things. And remember, this is complicated because monarchies came from God. The king was God's representative on earth. And there were stained glass windows that attested to that. Now imagine trying to argue against a monarchy as the representative of God using stained glass windows. Have to do it this way. And what's astounding about this, there are only 1.5 million colonists and 600,000 copies of this were made and distributed in six months. Between January and the Declaration of Independence, almost every family in America got a copy of this thing and a lot of them were able to follow the argument. That defined what the whole thing was about and the Declaration of Independence was a manifesto that outlined just in no uncertain terms what the, what the issues were. This is the context of it. Now imagine trying to do this today. You need 120 million copies of this. Not an inconsiderable feat. Not even TV Guide has that many. Think about it. And the mass medium that we have today, television, cannot carry this argument. You cannot put Tom Paine's argument, no matter what you do. It doesn't go into television, because television is not about arguments. Television is about showing you various kinds of things, the personalities. Carl Sagan's Cosmos was not about science. It was about Carl Sagan. But what was great about it is that it got four million people to buy Carl Sagan's B-O-O-K. And that B-O-O-K was about science. Science was in there. So television was until so you could make a pretty good ad campaign to get people to go out and buy this. But even the, the Los Angeles Times would be hard-pressed, its rotary presses, to actually supply the discourse that built this country. And we have no other discourse to replace it. The television is not a replacement media. Now think about this. Now here's the other thing to think about is this thing is almost impossible to read off a of CRT. You ever notice when anything long happens on a CRT, you print it out? You ever wondered why? Well, we found out 20 years ago at Xerox Park. I'm a really good reader, and we designed the best displays that money could buy back at Xerox Park, and I was astounded, even with all of the typography that we put in there, that I couldn't read it nearly as well as I could read a book, and it looked like it. So we finally tracked people's eyes who were reading the CRTs, and we discovered that the better the reader you were, the less easy it was to read off a CRT. And the reason is, is that, and everybody, if you can do this without poking your neighbor, this is an interesting thing. If you look straight ahead and wiggle your hands out here, go ahead, this is California. <laughs> so wiggle your hands outside your field of vision, then gradually bring them in. At some point, you'll see a flicker out to the side, but you won't see what it is. Everybody notice that? You can't see its fingers. Okay, now why did nature do that? Well, the reason nature did it is that all of the resolution in our eye almost is concentrated in a little thing that's smaller than a quarter, and our eyes see by bouncing around like this. To compensate for that, nature built into our eyes that out in the periphery where we're almost blind, that our sensitivity to brightness change would be a factor of 100 more than it is straight on. Every pilot knows this one. Okay, and so when there's a flicker out here, what does your eye do? It goes, <laughs> what is it looking for? The saber-toothed tiger. Right? We don't have eyes in the back of our head. So, why? so every time you try and read something extensive off a of CRT, your eyes are constantly looking for the saber-toothed tiger around the periphery of the screen because you can't see it blinking when you're looking straight ahead, but your peripheral vision can see it blinking. You just have to realize this. So people who try and teach reading on a computer that has a CRT are giving the kids something that is anti what the process of reading is physiologically. Do you suppose anybody cared to even test that out? No. It's been known for a long time, but nobody in education has ever, I say at every talk, just to give you a point of view that there's always a Faustian bargain you make with technology. Right? If you walk up and there's a knife on the ground, you've never seen one before, you might pick it up by the blade instead of the handle. And that is what you're starting to do with computers. If you can't tell the blade from the handle, 
on a tool, you should probably just let it lay there until you find out what the blade in the handle is. Now, fortunately, there is a, a solution, which is flat panel displays don't blink. And the reason we thought of the this kind of this kind of computer was thought of back in 1968, and it was partly thought of in the terms not just to be portable, like this, but to have a display that actually would match up with what our eyes and physiology can actually do. Now, notice I got that out of the way, and the reason is, is if you step on one of those, it breaks. Whereas, <laughs> when you were a kid, did you ever hit a baseball with a book? So it, in Utah, 25 years ago, I did shock tests to see what the acceleration Im imparted to a computer would be if you hit a baseball with it. And it's about 750 Gs. Right? So we're a ways from being able to do all of the things that books have served us. <laughs> Every culture has done science if science is being interested in how the world works. Every culture has done mathematics because every culture is interested in counting things. Right? So every culture computes and every culture... But the problem is, is that there are thresholds. And what you really need to be worried about is not whether the kids have access to this stuff, but whether their access is in a form that's above threshold. Because if it isn't, all you're going to get is form and no content. You'll just get another thing to dumb the kids down. Just be another way of doing it. Okay, and I think the, perhaps the second one is in league with the first point, and that is that illiteracy is not nearly as dangerous, or non-literacy is not nearly as dangerous as unliteracy. Right, so we have maybe 30 million to 60 million, depending on who's counting, of people who don't read at all in any functional way in the U.S., and people worry about it. But the thing I worry about is the 200 plus million people who cannot follow the argument in this book. Those are the non-literates, right? I'm sorry, those are the unliterates. So we have people who don't know anything about science, but the worst people we have might be a high school chemistry teacher who actually doesn't understand how chemistry works, right? So that's unscience. Or we can think of unmusic. And whenever we get this, we get this substitution that allows us to act as though we're doing something important. Well, I think a good way to close is uh, a couple of weeks ago I was at Vice President Gore's house for dinner with a bunch of other people uh, talking about the information superhighway, um, talking about problems of education, very similar set of concerns that, uh, that you have here today. And Al Gore is very concerned about getting access for uh, every child in America. And it sounds good. It sounds like a good idea. But my wife actually had a really wonderful argument that she, that she countered him with. And her argument went like this. She said, look, most of the important information in the world is already in free public libraries accessible to all. It's really not on the internet yet, and it isn't. It's already there in books. And the big problem is who goes and makes use of it and who doesn't go and make use of it. And she said the real haves and have-nots now and in the future are going to be those who either have discernment or have not discernment. Right? It's not a question of processing information. And there was a statement earlier that the, the LA Times only publishes 1% of the stuff it gets. It would even be better, I think, if it published a quarter percent of what it gets. That is one of the most important functions for both educators and institutions. Like the, This is why the newspaper will never go away, although the paper form of it might, because the editorial function is what is important about any newspaper. And the editorial function is going to be 10 times as important when people start getting more things off the Internet. And the editorial function is part of what discernment meant. Now, uh, Thomas Jefferson said something very similar. I was very proud of... My, my wife had it right on the nose. He said, uh, 
he knew of no safer repository for the powers in a country than in the people, and if the people's discretion was not finely tuned enough, then it was up to us to better inform their discretion. Thank you.